Okay, if everyone could take their seats. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to get started now. So if everyone could also stop their side conversations. Uh, before um, we jump into our afternoon session, so we appreciate everyone's attention. Um, we know this is a lot of sitting in a room, but on the other hand, um, uh, the presentations, people have worked really hard on them and they're really amazing, so we appreciate your continued attention. Um, before we get started, um, we are really excited to have Hank Ovink here, uh, who has been a really inspirational person in creating this project, and so he's here just to uh, say a few words to help us get excited for the next round of this challenge. Okay. Um, um, thank you all for being here. It's amazing. Um, I was asked not to do slides because then you're stuck with me for the rest of the day. Uh, but I can do that without slides. <laughs> um, just a couple of notions, uh, not, to, uh, uh, um, not to take away your attention for the teams, because it's all about the teams uh, today uh, and the amazing work uh, uh, they've done thus far. Uh, also, uh, uh, the supporting team of Resilient by Design, I think. Yeah. <laughs> You all did a fantastic job, 50 uh, places uh, in the last uh, uh, weeks, uh, seeing everyone and everything. Uh, and I think that's a really important uh, part. Um, I flew in this morning. I actually have a, a weird relationship with climate change. Um, I make it worse. Um, uh, I'm in three continents every month, uh, and I don't do this in a boat with a sail, but with a plane. Uh, but I assure you, I buy every time a forest uh, or some trees. Uh, I think it's a forest every month. Uh, um, so I flew in from Buenos Aires, uh, but I actually came uh, from Bonn, the climate conference. Um, I want to talk to you a little about uh, the importance of the work uh, you're doing. Because uh, um, we were chatting over lunch and somebody said, you know, it's like, a, sea level rise, camp, uh, party, festival. <laughs> and I think that's very good. Um, uh, uh, you've been crisscrossing this region and you're falling in love. Eh? This is what it is. Eh? Uh, you're getting attached uh, to the place, uh, the challenges and the people. Uh, and there's a reason uh, why. And I'm, I get my list. It's, and you can, you know, there's lists every day. Uh, but uh, just of today and yesterday, in Greece, deadly floods. Uh, in Sri Lanka, 1,700 displaced. Nine dead in Indonesia. Uh, Colombia, uh, more uh, death and despair. Kenya, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, India. Thailand, Germany, Poland, uh, Central America, Honduras, New York, Nicaragua, Guatemala. This is just the last two weeks. Um, so when Harvey hit Houston, um, people were complaining that the 1,200 or more casualties in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh were not top of the news, which was in the same week. But my Bangladeshi colleagues I was with at that time said, um, we mourn with the United States uh, for the death and despair, uh, but for us it's important uh, that that is in the news too. Climate change is not a developing world country's issue. This is what you are working on, and the importance of that you should not underestimate, because we are in the amazing opportunity to come up with the best ideas, real solutions for real people uh, in real communities that are really suffering socially, economically, and by climate change that can really make this place better and inspire the world. Don't forget this. Your, your mission, your 
Sea Level Rise party is watched eh, now online or you know after I've talked online again with the teams uh, is watched and whatever you will come up will be an inspiration for so many people that do not have the capacity, do not have the resources and do not have the networks uh, as you guys have. So uh, uh, that's one message I wanted to give you in the, uh, and the other is, and you know, I'm on the jury, so I can't talk to what the team said, eh? so all amazing. Uh, <laughs> we will get to uh, uh, jury comments uh, uh, in a later time. Um, but I do think um, three years ago was my lecture at Spur in July. Uh, at the board meeting, uh, board dinner that night, and um, we were in the middle of rebuild by design, the the thing in New York you well, uh, heard about, I guess, and um, uh, and then uh, they asked me. They said, "Hey, Hank, you were lucky, eh? In New York, you had Sandy." And I said, "What do you mean? Well, got attention." You know, sixty thousand, sixty billion dollars of damage, all these houses lost, uh, federal, state, local. I said, so, so you're telling me that California needs a disaster to become smart and do a thing like any normal person would do is look at the future and say, oh, that's complex. Let's work on that. And uh, they said. Uh, yes. <laughs> I said, no, you can do this. Three years later, uh, here you are. Uh, so everyone can do this. And I'm proud to uh, tell you that last week in uh, Bonn, I launched an uh, initiative. Uh, I started uh, in Asia, the place that's going to be hit hardest or is hit hardest by climate change these days, uh, with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, it's called Water as Leverage. You can look it up on the internet, wateraslleverage.org. I'm a water envoy, so I talk about water the whole time. Uh, and it's a, focusing at the same thing Rebuild by Design was focusing on, and Resilient by Design is too. And it is getting this talent, this amazing group of people from all over the world, eh, including local, together to rethink the future. And you would, you know, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I think this is like normal. Eh? This is what we should do, but it's not. This is exceptional. We should make this the next new normal. I mean, climate change is the new normal, but you should be the new normal. Your way of working, investing upfront to really understand vulnerabilities, interdependencies, opportunities, work with people, and, you know, you know the term low-hanging fruit? Yeah? You do? <laughs> Who used, uses this? Do you, you just be honest. I mean, we're among friends. The door is closed. Just raise your hand. Who uses low-hanging fruit? Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> you know why? You are not here for low-hanging fruit. You are here for high-hanging fruit. You are here to inspire, but also to make a difference. You can't escape. The door is, well, ajar, but forget it. Yeah. I'll close it myself. You can't escape. I want you for the best projects, the ones that really, really make a difference, the ones that bridge the gap between our current policies current ways of interaction, our current politics, yeah, our total disconnect with the future of climate change and the way we're dealing with it. You can do this. You can bridge this gap, but not with low-hanging fruit. So go. I love you too, really. I'm amazed by the work thus far. I will be more amazed end of the day. Um, I'll be with you. Uh, the whole competition, uh, but also after. And I think perhaps that's the last word. 
uh, this won't stop. Don't worry, we'll make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Now, uh, without further ado, we're going to jump into our first presentation of the afternoon, Public Sediment. Great. So, it's difficult to see. So I'm Gina Worth. I'm from Scape Landscape Architecture and the Dredge Research Collaborative. And I am incredibly excited to be here today to talk about MUD and show the work of a collaborative and incredible team, including Dredge Research Collaborative. Dred Brett Milligan is here in the back representing that group. Arcadis, Tia Studio, Buoyant Ecologies Lab, uh, and UC Davis. We're incredibly excited to share uh, kind of our research. Our team really believes that the Balins is living infrastructure. This, this mosaic of ecosystems, the marshes and mudflats that shape this region are the infrastructure of the future that we should be investing in today. The Baylands are incredible. They host our food sources. They treat our waste. They are these vast, uh, almost incomprehensible places in terms of their scale, yet they hold these bundles of critical infrastructure at their shore. The ports, the dredge channels, the train lines, the highways. Um, they also host species, uh, threatened and endangered species, at different points in their life cycle. And while they appear passive, while they seem like these large passive expanses of green and brown and blue, they protect us and buffer and cushion the impacts of sea level rise and flooding. Yet these balins, these resources, face slow and invisible risk. Hank is right. There is no immediate disaster that this region has encountered. The disaster is slow and will happen over time. But it will be disastrous if we do not act now. This is an urgent problem. This is an urgent problem for people in terms of the number of people, critical infrastructure, including drinking water, transportation networks, energy networks that are at the Bayland interface, but it's also an issue for these ecosystems themselves. And this quote has been really inspirational for our work uh, from the Bayland's climate change report that most of the marshes are projected to be damaged or destroyed by 2100 unless we intervene now. So while there is no major disaster, this is the major disaster, and the Baylands are the infrastructure that our team proposes that we invest in today. This risk is joint ecological and human, and we have focused on these issues in our definition of this question. Um, we've looked at this mosaic of ecosystems that really spans from the subtidal environs to mudflats to marshes, what kind of within this tidal range, the diked ponds, and then the vulnerable communities that exist at the edge. The exciting thing about balins, the tidal balins, is that they have the ability to grow along with the threat of climate change if that happens at a slower rate. If we are faced with higher levels of sea level rise than we anticipate, and we have low sediment in the system, these ecosystems, these balins, will change over time. Mudflats will expand, marshes will shrink, and with higher rates of sea level rise, like seven feet by 2100, these ecosystems will drown, and vulnerable shoreline communities will be highly impacted. We will have deeper water at the shoreline, which will be damaging for populations along the edge and damaging for infrastructure along the edge as well as large-scale ecological change. Um, and so our team feels that what's at the core of this question, it's mud. It's this mucky substance at the bottom of the bay is really kind of core to this, this future ecological trajectory that we are already advancing along. We believe that sediment is the building block of resilience in the bay. And many scientists have begun to look at these questions. And there's many reports kind of beginning to show how this ecosystem, the Bayland, the tidal Bayland ecosystem, will transform over time if we are faced with high levels of sea level rise and low levels of sediment like we have today. Um, we know that sediment builds Baylands. This is kind of an abstract concept to begin to think about. Um, we have really modified how sediment flows through our systems. Uh, we've modified this really differently over time. So historically, sediment flowed downstream from tributaries local to the bay and from the large-scale rivers of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River. And so these, these systems, these, these conduits of sediment, brought sediment to the bay and built the marshes that we know. However, we, again, we really intervene in these systems. Uh, in the era of the gold rush, we power washed the hillsides through hydraulic mining and actually increased the sediment loads that came down to the bay and actually built more marsh with this pulse of sediment that moved through. 
But this pulse is over, and now we face a totally different condition, which is that we have sediment trapped upstream. We have built huge, we have invested in a huge way in infrastructure that stops the flow of sediment. So we have dams, we have flood control channels, and this means that sediment is not making it to the bay, and that bayland interface is not able to keep up with the pace of climate change. So how much sediment is needed? This is like a really difficult question. Our team struggled for weeks around this question of trying to figure out what is going on. And while we did a lot of calculations and charts, we ultimately just decided to use the best science that was available out there, which is the work of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. This is some of the work that's being shown um, at the Estuary Conference a couple weeks ago. Um, and it shows this chart of how much sediment might be needed just to sustain the existing tidal balance that we have today with three and a half feet of sea level rise and a low sediment supply. So what's shown on the right is what's coming in from local tributaries and the delta, and what's shown on the left is how much might be needed over time. And this is a really variable number. Though this is informed by science, there's a huge number of uncertainties that we have to factor in. We might have a higher sediment supply in the future if we have catastrophic fires and erosion, but we also might have much greater needs for sediment if the sea levels rise faster than anticipated. And if we restore more tidal wetlands, these are more spaces that will need sediment in the future. So all of this work is like very complicated and very interesting, but the big conclusion is that there is not enough mud to sustain the ecosystems that we know. So what are other sources? How can we think more creatively about this material? How can we think about tributaries, realign them to actually move more sediment downstream? Break up dams, harvest dams, think about using the sediment source in a different way. How can we think about repurposing dredge material? Right now, 30% of all dredge material leaves the bay. It's treated as a waste product and it is dumped offshore. And this is not due to a lack of, of care or a lack of intelligence around the system. We need to collaborate to make sure this doesn't happen and find new funding mechanisms, new regulatory mechanisms, and new physical design techniques to keep the mud in the bay. Uh, we also need to consider new sources, totally unconventional sources like biosolids, tunnel fill, levee deconstruction. But even with all of these, these sources, is this enough mud? That was a question for us. So we began to look at that. Um, and these maps, again, the need is shown in the bright yellow and the sources are shown in brown. So even if there was this huge effort to marshal all of these different sources and apply them in the bay and have this like giant mud management strategy to move stuff around, we still have a really big discrepancy between what the tidal balance are projected to need today and what is available in the future. And this discrepancy just grows if we have higher rates of sea level rise. So our team has come to the conclusion that the balance will change and they potentially will change dramatically. And we have to position ourselves now to truly address this. Um, and so what does the future look like? We are projecting a large scale transition from marsh to mudflat to open water. This is terrifying if you're an ecologist, I think, especially if you study coastal wetland and estuarine systems because it would mean a complete transformation of this ecological fabric. But I think it also should be terrifying if you are a resident of the Bay Area, because this means we will have deeper water closer to our front doors. We will have a much more vulnerable system if our bayland infrastructure drowns over time. This has different spatial impacts in different parts of the bay. In the North Bay, this mosaic, this transformation from marsh to mudflat to open water has dramatic impacts on the communities that are at the tips of the tributaries. So you can kind of see in the red on these slides the impacted communities. But in the South Bay, we have massively developed in the floodplain, so it has an even more transformative impact. This bayland cushion, this amazing kind of mosaic of ecosystems that helps buffer the tidal range is sinking, is, is, is drowning over time, and this, this network, this kind of swath or this band of urban areas will become much more vulnerable and exposed. So we think this is problematic, it's ecologically problematic, it's problematic for people, um, and we are proposing to really invest in, investigate and invest in the Bayland ecosystems. Um, and I think what's exciting about working in the Bay Area uh, is that we think you have the capacity to do this. Um, there is this legacy of Bay activism and kind of organizing around these ecological resources that's hugely inspiring to us coming from New York City. We see a lot more of it here, so that's a really 
exciting environment to be in. Um, it has this legacy of organizing against bay filling at this very large scale. And this map on the left uh, became a template for change and organizing and the creation of Save the Bay over time. And we see the map on the right is kind of equally critical right now to organize around this slow and invisible risk of a deeper, harder bay with more vulnerable communities at its edges and more vulnerable ecosystems. So what should we do? These are really big problems. Um, and so we do not propose any singular silver bullet solution. There is no silver bullet solution to this, 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 this threat. We have a low sediment supply likely in the future. We, we know that sediment, uh, that sea level, rises or sea level rise is exacerbating. Um, and our team is attempting to bend this curve. We are attempting to change this trajectory through the strategies that we call public sediment. So these strategies, this is a constellation of approaches. This is not a singular piece of infrastructure or a singular move. This is a suite of strategies that are physical about designing with mud, but they are also social. This is about making sediment public and making this resource valued, known, and recognized as part of our resilient infrastructure and part of the systems that we invest in in the future. And so we think it's incredibly critical to apply public sediment strategies across this longitudinal cross-section from upland to lowland to the, the interface to the bay edges. We propose to design with mud across this suite of places, and we propose to make sediment public within communities and connect them to the bay, connect them to this critical resource. This, this is public sediment. And so as we begin to kind of walk through these spaces, we begin to see what we are talking about when we're talking about designing with mud. We're talking about harvesting dams. We're talking about redesigning channels to move sediment through them. We're talking about creating pools and places for sediment to gather. We're also talking about connecting communities along and across these resources to tributaries and to the bay through a series of mudrooms and sensing stations that really make this very intangible topic, visceral and real. Um, we also are hoping to open and unlock the flows of these creeks and allow them to enter the baylands themselves and have new strategies, to experiment with new strategies for designing and placing mud and other sources of sediment, like dredge material, in the bay in more passive ways that allow the sediment to move around with the currents. And so this project and proposal is translated now into three design opportunities. Um, and these design opportunities operate across three scales. We have a regional scale of project, a South Bay scale of project, and a tributary scale of project. Um, but this is not a master plan, and it's not three projects that are kind of independent. These projects are, I, I think, activist in the way they're trying to suggest we have to think totally differently about these systemic resources. We have to change the system, we have to value ecosystems differently, we have to value them as infrastructure, and we have to test these strategies in the most meaningful way possible. And so these are our three projects. The first, the first we call Pilots for a Future Bay. And so this is our regional proposal, but really it's our smallest scale proposal because we have identified a series of small scale pilot projects that we think can change the system. These pilot projects are both physical and regulatory in nature. So we think they, that, that these questions really require collaboration and discussion between between our, our regulatory partners and our kind of physical design partners. So we propose underwater mud berms, we propose biosolids as a substrate for wetland building, we propose dam releases, uh, specifically at Searsville Dam as the kind of pilot case study, and we propose building new habitat for risk reduction purposes and, and kind of challenging, challenging these questions around habitat conversion because we know habitats will convert in the future. Um, so again, these are strategies and proposals that are pilot in nature. We would like to test them, but we would also like designers to engage in the regulatory conversations and the policy conversations that frame this work. This is our bay, our mud, and all of these resources must stay in the bay, and we think this series of pilots could really help advance that question. We also think while they can scale up and influence the region, they will be most influential if we work with students today to begin to develop them. So as part of this project, we propose to work with middle and high school students to design the pilots as they are ecosystem stewards of the future and will need to scale up public sediment strategies. Our second project is called the Bay Cushion. We love this word cushion because it's very descriptive of that 
dissipating, buffering impact that the Baylands have. Uh, we need to value ecosystems as protective infrastructure, not just as infrastructure for the salt marsh harvest mouse or the clapper rail, but as infrastructure for people. Um, the South Bay Salt Ponds is this incredible project um, that we were just amazed with when we went to go see this work about the, the kind of opening up of these big salt ponds to tidal exchange, growing and restoring marshes and mudflats of the future. Um, but it is not currently valued or invested in as a piece of risk reduction infrastructure. And so scientists also are beginning to look at this work. Mark Stacy did a modeling analysis of the South Bay salt ponds, uh, and he did a version where the South Bay salt ponds had hard edges, and he found that this actually amplified the tidal extremes throughout the entire bay um, in, with, a, with a sea level rise of, I think, about a meter. And that he found, also found that a scenario where he studied opening up these tidal ponds to tidal exchange and that that shallow water at the edge of the bay dissipated tidal force around the entire bay. So this is a, the South Bay is a kind of very particular local condition that has bay scale impact. That's incredibly interesting and incredibly valuable and we're very excited about that potential and we think that we should be investing in this project, in this restoration project as a piece of risk reduction infrastructure. But we also know the South Bay, just like all other edges of the bay, while it accretes more rapidly, also faces the same challenge of low sediment supply and sea level rise. And so in this project, we propose to look at this and say, what can we do to prevent this trajectory? Because this is not just bad for habitat, this is bad for people living at the edges. What is the future of the bay cushion? How do we preserve the function of this bay cushion over time? And how do we do it with low sediment alternatives? How do we invest differently how do we invest with money differently, but also how do we invest with sediment differently in this project? Um, and so these are just some speculative proposals, but if we work on this project, we would like to model and study these different alternatives. An outer ring of marshes, a double ring of mudflats and marshes, and a large scale kind of migration alternative. Looking at these potential futures, what risk reduction benefits they have, how they might be sustainable from a sediment supply standpoint, and how might they impact future habitat of the South Bay. And so while this is a layer onto the adaptive management project that's already underway, um, we also think it's incredibly important to engage people in this question. While the South Bay Salt Pond is really viewed as a recreational resource, we know it is a cushion to the neighborhoods adjacent to the bay, and that we must begin to engage people in these questions, to bring them closer um, to these systems, to understand and monitor and provide community tools for organizing around the impacts of climate change a series of sensors kind of spread throughout these neighborhoods like Alviso, which are right at the edge and already facing the impacts of groundwater and sea level rise today, um, but also creating spaces for more visceral interaction, mud rooms within the bay where people can go engage with this resource. And so this is a large scale ecological modeling proposal, but it is also a very fine grained community capacity building and organizing tool for the South Bay. Our third proposal, our last proposal, uh, is called Unlock Alameda Creek. And I think our whole team is super psyched about this project. We wanna work in a big trib. We think tributaries are kind of key to this question. Um, Alameda is the largest tributary that feed, largest local tributary that feeds the bay. And we really feel like this is the most meaningful place that we can apply a public sediment of the future today. So tributaries are connective. They truly connect sediment to the baylands, which I think Everyone understands now. <laughs> but they also, they connect fish, right? So there's these, these, these species of fish that require the tributaries to, to gain access to their upstream spawning ground. They also connect people. They can divide neighborhoods, but they also can connect people to one another and to the bay. But these tributaries have been designed almost exclusively for flood control. They've been sterilized, they've been channelized, they've been contained. And we think that we need to think differently about these tributaries. We must still protect for flooding. It's incredibly important that we don't expose any of these communities to future flood risk, but we must think about redesigning these tributaries to be much more ecologically and socially productive spaces. Uh, so we propose to apply our suite of public sediment strategies to this tributary to harvest the uplands, to unlock the channel, to, to place mud in the bay in a different way, but also connect people to this story, to apply this network of tributary paths, of mud rooms, of sensing stations, to connect along this and create a kind of critical fabric of, of uh, infrastructure, of social infrastructure that leads to the bay. And then finally, to design with a sediment sensitive species. Um, our team 
admittedly is obsessed with mud, and so we have chosen to look at steelhead, which is actually quite sensitive to sediment in the water, and steelhead use this route to spawn today, uh, and we'd like to design to make sure that we are preserving that route and not doing anything to damage that critical habitat in the future. Actually, we're trying to enhance that critical habitat in the future. So we think this is possible to do today here in Alameda Creek to really unlock its physical, social, and sediment potential. Um, and again, it's an incredibly scalar project and suite of ideas, but we think they will combine here in Alameda Creek uh, in the form of dam harvesting, in the form of channel design, in the form of sensing stations, in the form of levee breaching, and also to, to kind of truly create a space that connects its communities with the bay, with these larger stories about how mud actually creates this bayland, these protective cushions for the region, um, and will scale up over time. So we're incredibly excited about this project, um, Alameda Creek project and process, uh, but also excited because we think it's replicable. It's highly replicable to all the other tributaries that feed the bay uh, and help promote living infrastructure of the future. Thank you.